Hello and welcome to Exploring the Birds of Thornberry and the Area. This is a very special program to me because of the fact that I actually grew up in Markdale. So having grown up there, I actually know a lot of the local birds. And my first really good experiences with birding was actually in the Beaver Valley. So having the local knowledge and uh, now years of experience is really a lot going to allow me to share with you the, uh, the birds of, of the Thornberry area. So I'm really looking forward to that. So I might as well get going here. And uh, first we'll start off with owls. So snowy owls have actually been reported in the Thornberry area quite a bit the past few winters, especially along Highway 26. And generally, uh, sometimes along the Georgian Bay uh, uh, shoreline as well too. But I have seen them personally in the Markdale area as well as down towards Dundalk. Dundalk area seems to be a little bit more um, trustworthy when it comes to having them come back each year. They generally always do seem to end up there near the windmills. So that's something to keep an eye out for. I often see them on fence posts, uh, other, uh, you know, in the field, sometimes sitting on a snow patch if there's been a thaw and hydro poles. So there's a lot of areas where they can be seen close to the road. And I often enjoy that part because of the fact they are one of the few owls that you can really get close to in the winter and not really have to worry about scaring them. They have a very good tolerance of, of uh, staying around people where some other species, especially other birds, types of birds, tend to try to, you know, basically vacate the area. Some neat facts about them as well. They are a, a bird that can handle up to minus 40 degrees Celsius slash Fahrenheit, even a little bit colder than that. So when you're looking at them and you're thinking, oh, we have poor cold bird out there, it's actually the other way around. They're probably looking at you and go, oh, you poor cold human. Barred owls have actually been reported in the Flushington area and that as well too. So it's something to keep an eye out for. They're not as common as uh, maybe the snowy owl, but uh, the barred owl is something that you can see along the roadsides in uh, Gray County. The northern hawk owl, now that is one that can end up there and then sometimes it may not. It's uh, very rare in Southern Ontario, but it's one I put on there because it can be one of those accidental birds that you see during the winter that has come down and to push a little further south. Looking for food is generally how they will uh, end up here. And uh, Schomburg was uh, a winter ago. And then uh, also in the Ottawa area is another good one. But still, like I said, they can end up in the Thornberry area as well too. It's just I haven't heard any reports in recent years, but uh, not everyone reports their their birds as well too. Now the eastern screech owl uh, is a fairly common one, but it is one that can be hard to find because you can see how well it blends in with the trees not here. So it is something where you're out for a hike, just check each tree knot. That's really how I've done it as well too, is just looking into tree knots. Some people have had them land on their uh, newspaper box as well as uh, in their backyard. So if you strike it lucky that way, good for you. If not, well, <laughs> there's at least uh, the possibility that you may see one. And then this, the sawwood owl. The sawwood owl is another one. It migrates through generally in the spring uh, kind of in the spring in April and then October during the uh, fall. So that's one to keep an eye out for. And then of course the short-eared owl. Well, the short-eared owl is one that I would suspect would be more so in the Dundalk area. I have not seen it in Thornberry specifically. You might actually get to see some in the Beaver Valley, especially along the lower part near uh, Kimberley towards uh, I guess the Heathcote area there, that would be something that I would keep an eye out for if I was in there because of the fact that it's their terrain. It's just that there's not really any reliable reports when it comes to that aspect, but still keep an eye out for them because they do, they are across all across southern Ontario. And then there's the long-eared owl, very similar. Check pine trees, spruce trees, and uh, you never know what you can come up with that way. Then there's the northern shrike, which is more like a nicknamed butcher bird because it's actually a small songbird that will hunt um, 
voles and moles and even other small songbirds. So just keep an eye out. This is kind of an example of some of their uh, prey here, although not the time of year, because generally the northern shrike, if it's going to be in the Thornberry area, is actually going to be in the winter time. That tends to be when they uh, stop here. And then, and so if you are looking for them and you want to go a little further, the Grand Valley area is a pretty good area as well too. Eastern kingbirds. Now that is a bird you can enjoy throughout uh, many parts of Ontario. Uh, if you have a nest in your yard, they are ones that will swoop towards you. And that, so if you ever have a kind of grayish black white bird that's swooping at you, it's a good chance that uh, it's an Eastern Kingbird. Now, as for the great crested flycatcher, the first one I ever saw of this was actually in the Beaver Valley. So I do know that they pass through there as well as nest in the area. So definitely a good bird to keep an eye out for any time from basically late April, May into uh, even into August, September when they start their return trip uh, back south as well, especially in September. There's the blue gray gnat catcher. I generally see them in late April, early May, and they do like to catch uh, flies. So they'll kind of sit on a limb and then fly outward, swoop at a bug and then land back on the limb, whether it's the same spot or just a little bit further down. That's generally how you'll, how you'll see them. Then we have the rough grouse as well. And this is one that I've seen in the Meaford area as well as Holland Center and in the Beaver Valley as well too. And they love to feed on uh, berries and that. So that's, that's where I've seen them roadside. And here's one that's not in our area, but not too far away. And that's the spruce grouse. And you go to Algonquin generally each winter and have a good chance of experiencing one of them. I like to show stuff that's kind of within a drive and uh, that is definitely one that is worth seeing because you can see a lot of the other winter finches there at that time of year as well too. So we're going to take a moment here and look at some of the weather and uh, this is something neat that you can see over Georgian Bay and that is water spouts with birds migrating at the same time. So you have the cormorants there and they generally start to migrate back in and uh, the months of uh, kind of the you know late August, September, October and what's really neat about them is the fact that uh, there's so many of them. You can see them in really neat flocks flying really low to the surface of the water as well, too. Then there's roll clouds, which you're just looking at there. And this is the front side of it. You'll notice birds will actually gather on the front side of that because of the fact that you have lift. And when you have that lift, the birds kind of get a free flight and get to travel with it. So you're going to get to see an example of that here. We have collapsing thunderstorms off in the distance. And then you can you could kind of see a roll cloud that appeared there and then disappears. This is the technical term is an outflow boundary. But what you're looking at is it tries to build again and then eventually it actually comes ashore. And now you're seeing this cloud here and you'll see when I speed up the film that it actually is coiling there. And that's what I mean by the lift on the front of it. You're going to get to see a bunch of birds here, even though there's no clouds at this point. The wind is still pushing ashore and they're kind of hovering or traveling along with it right along the shoreline. So you'll see again, so you, you can see vultures, gulls, and uh, even birds of prey uh, using these uh, winds to travel uh, without using a lot of energy. And then of course, have to show a tornado forming here because of the fact that there's actually gulls flying along the backside of what's called the rear flight downdraft. So they were actually following the cooler, stable, drier air around the back of it. You'll see it come again on screen here where they're actually going into the warm, moist air there. So shortly after that, about three minutes after all those gulls flew through, the tornado did touch down and you can see that off in the distance here. And uh, so that's it just kind of gives you an idea of how some of the weather and uh, plays a role in birds' habits. And here's another great example of a convergence line. And you can see all the cormorants flying through as they continue to migrate south as well too. Here's a water spout in the background. Like I said, you can see those over Georgian Bay and just keep an eye out. If you're seeing a spout, keep an eye on the birds activities around there too. You'll see, I'm sure you'll see some form of activity because of the fact that generally when water spouts form, there's thermals in the area as well too. Now we're gonna get on to what's called fallout. So let's say a warm front has set up right across Thornberry. So on the southern side of Thornberry, you have southerly winds. And then on the north side of Thornberry, you have over Georgia Bay, you have northerly winds. Well, these birds don't like, when they're coming back from 
for spring, they don't like to have headwinds because headwinds will actually cause them to, uh, you know, burn up more energy. So what they do is they'll come and land. Well, what will happen is, let's say, for example, this happened at Thornberry, you'd have hundreds of different, maybe even thousands of birds there with multiple different species, all uh, kind of stranded at the shoreline until the weather becomes more favorable. And that's usually warm fronts in the first, you know, last week of April, first two to three weeks of of uh, May that will have this take place. So it's just something to keep an eye out for. And uh, because it is really neat when you get to see, you know, hundreds, even thousands of birds together. And Point Peely is another great location. And the U.S. Gulf, Cor Gulf Coast is also another one for that too. And of course, in these big migrations, you can have turkey vultures. And turkey vultures are one of those birds that you can generally see flying back through as early as kind of the, even the first few weeks of March, right on up through until the end of, uh, you know, end of April. And indigo buntings, the first one that I ever saw was actually in Meaford, right along the shoreline, an absolute beauty of a bird and generally feeds kind of in kind of brushy riparian forest edges. So you can see that here that and they love to sing as well as feed at the same time. So you're going to, get to see a great example of that here. So they are definitely in, in, your, uh, in the Thornberry area. And uh, one that I thoroughly enjoy each summer. Some people say they look like they should have been called the bluebird, which I can understand by looking at it. But if you saw the eastern bluebird, you would understand why it's also called the, the bluebird. This is actually more of an indigo color. And the gray cat bird, if you're ever looking in the woods and you hear what sounds like a cat, and then of course you look in and a bird flies out and you don't see a cat, chances are it's the gray cat bird. Now, as for the scarlet tanager, the first ones that I ever saw of them was actually in the Beaver Valley as well too. So it's one to keep an eye out for. That's the brilliant male with the red and then the more, the color that blends more was the female there as well. So she can be on the nest and not stand out like the, uh, the male there does. The orchard oriole is one that is pushing more into Southern Ontario all the time. So it's definitely one worth keeping an eye out for, especially around Thornberry, around the orchards and that as well too. Just keep an eye out for them. You never know when an accidental will uh, pop up. They are more towards Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, but still quite possible there as well too. Then we have the rose-breasted grosbeak and the first one I ever had was actually at my feeder in Markdale. They love sunflower seeds so if you put that out in the spring you may have one visit you for a few days and there's the female as well too and uh, just uh, but otherwise you'll see them kind of in the canopy of trees as well unless it's colder weather they come down more to the lower levels then and here's the eastern bluebird here an absolutely striking bird. Uh, similar as the robin, there's the female, so they are in the robin family, but brilliant blue, especially in the spring, but even in the winter in the southern parts of the province, this is actually December here, you can still see a very striking blue color with it with the chestnut chest as well too. Now when it comes to our woodpeckers, the this is actually a photo from the Beaver Valley, the yellow-bellied sapsucker. Uh, it is one that I love to uh, love to look at because, and its name too. What's neat about it is the fact that uh, they drill little wells and then sap leaks into them and they actually don't drink the sap, it's the bugs they're after. That's what they really want. So that is something that uh, you don't have to, it's not, not the sap to go after, but it's definitely, they love to draw in the bugs as well too. So that is one you can see in the Thornberry area. The red-bellied woodpecker is another one that can be seen there, but it's still kind of pushing itself back into, or expanding into Southern Ontario. Uh, basically where I live in the Niagara region, you can pretty much go anywhere and uh, see them. Whereas I would say they're still more sporadic north of the GTA, but it is, I do believe they will become more common as time goes on. And then we have the downy woodpecker. The downy woodpecker is the most common one, likely to be the first one you see at your feeder. You can draw them in with sunflower seeds, but peanuts are the best or peanut suet tends to be the best for that too. And they are throughout most of Ontario, but all of Southern Ontario. So it is one that you can experience there. The hairy woodpecker I've seen in the Beaver Valley, Markdale, Owen Sound area, as well as the Northern Flicker. So those are 
are a couple species that you can enjoy firsthand in the area as well too. And they'll often sing from the tops of trees, but they'll also feed on ants on your front yard as well too. This photo was actually taken in Markdale. So it gives you an idea of just how close to home this was. And same with this one, Pileated Woodpecker was taken right on Highway 26 there. And uh, this was actually my first ever photos of the Pileated Woodpecker. Something else you can keep an eye on for is uh, Purple Martin condos. So whenever you have purple martin condos, there's a good chance that there's purple martins in them as well too. So in April and May, when the, they come back, it's a good chance that you'll get to see them. And they usually always come back to their condos. So you just, you can patiently wait for them to come there and you can just sit there and enjoy them or you can even photograph them as well too. Then there's the beautiful tree swallows. So swallows, I generally have seen them throughout the leaf area. I've seen them in the Beaver Valley. And uh, so anywhere kind of Meaford to Leith, Beaver Valley, you have a good chance of seeing them. They often will use uh, even Eastern Bluebird nesting boxes as well too. So that is how I generally will, uh, you know, find both Eastern Bluebirds as well as uh, tree swallows. And then there's the barn swallow. I've seen them all through the Markdale kind of Dundalk area. And then I believe I've seen them near Meaford as well too. So I'm sure they're throughout the area. They have the name barn swallow, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll see them in barns, but I've often seen them in kind of uh, gazebos and things like that as well too. So we're looking at some of the habits of the Eastern Bluebird here. So often I'll see them on fence rows as well as kind of those hawthorn trees. And that's often how I'll locate a area where I feel like it could be suitable nesting for them because really finding a net active nesting box is really going to give you the best views and you can use your car as a blind where you sit in the car and you can just watch and enjoy their activity and even photograph them a bit or get a bit of video as well too because they will continuously come back. And like I said, the gray cat bird, uh, it's all through uh, southern Ontario and uh, I can I've heard them even into and seen them into November in the Niagara region so October wouldn't be too far out of the question when it comes to the Thornberry area as well too and of course we have the purple martin boxes so there's an example of a partial purple martin box and one of the things I found fascinating with the tree swallows is we often think that there's lots of nesting boxes well there's lots of nesting boxes but it's also there's a lot of competition for them as well as is it the right area for them so open fields is often where I'll see them but also along rivers especially if there's nesting boxes there as well too and so the competition can be quite quite fierce for them as you're going to see here and uh, so much so that you'll actually see that they it's a it's a violent fight uh, to keep that spot you can see a little bit of uh, blood unfortunately on this one to the right here so a lot of competition for these nesting boxes and I just got a little bit of fun here with you you can see bloopers here when you hit record and then the birds take off as soon as you hit record giving you one second videos and then of course having the birds uh, you know, a sheep move in the way you're blind basically sometimes they trade places you have a female cardinal there go down and then the house finch came up. So some of the neat things behind the scenes that I like to share here and there as well too. Then we have the common loon. So the common loon is one that you're more apt to see on Georgian Bay when they're actually migrating back south. And this would be right off the, I would go to the harbor for this too, especially near the mouth of the river there. And this is their non-breeding plumage. So you're actually getting to see them differently than what we usually see on say, for example, postcards. So, and they usually dive deep, but they will skim and feed. That's what you're seeing in this video here is one that is skimming and because the water's not that deep and it's skimming for food as it prepares to fly back south towards regions. So Niagara River is another one area where it stops as well as uh, the Atlantic Ocean and even the Gulf of Mexico, they will go all the way down there as well too. Mallard ducks, uh, this is one that you probably see even if you're not trying. So again, down at the, the harbor there, uh, Harrison Park and Owen Sound gives you a good start for birds if you haven't seen any because success at the beginning kind of really encourages you to keep uh, pushing as well as the fact that you can see ducklings in the spring as well too, which is always enjoyable. Then we have the 
American black duck, and their numbers are actually shrinking in southern Ontario uh, because of the fact that the, uh, the mallard is so aggressive when it comes to uh, mating. And then there's the gadwall duck. So this is something you would see over, you know, Georgian Bay uh, in the potentially in the winter until things start to freeze up. Just depends where they stop off with their migration as well, too. And then you saw the minks there. Minks will actually feed on ducks as well. So it uh, just gives you a little bit of idea that uh, even in the water, the ducks aren't 100 percent safe all the time. Then we have the hooded merganser. And you can see one here with its crest down and one with it up. And that is basically an alarm at that point. And then we have the common merganser, and that was actually taken in Thornberry area there as it was running across the water. And the northern shoveler. So these are birds that you would typically see more so in the spring migration. So if you have flooded fields nearby, just keep an eye out for them. Same with the blue winged teal duck that you're seeing here as well, too. And uh, because when you start to thaw out in the spring, they're looking for stopover places like the green winged teal here as well, too where they want to stop and feed. And that allows them to basically uh, take a break and then continue their migration northward. One of my favorite ducks is the wood duck. So that would be another one I'd look in ponds, swamps as they continue uh, northward. I don't usually see them around the lake too much, but uh, just keep an eye out for them in your pond or a pond nearby or a park nearby that has some water. Eagles, like the bald eagle, for example, are ones that will feed on on ducks as well too so you can kind of get a combination especially along georgian bay there where uh, near the tank range right on down to thornberry there i've seen them right along highway 20 26 there and they give you some fantastic views same with snowy owls they will also feed on ducks as well too often why they're along the uh, kind of the shoreline during the early part of the winter before things freeze up Pie bill grevy, although a common one, is not one that you typically uh, see that often. The redneck grevy, they are ones that you can see on Georgian Bay, and uh, I've seen some on the uh, Beaver River as well when I was younger. And uh, then there's the eared grevy as well. And now we're going to take a look at some habits here. So this is some of their habits. This is the American black duck out in the field here. So you can see them kind of scurrying around before they eventually do take off. And uh, so sometimes you can find some that are very tame. And uh, I find that uh, that's more kind of parks that have had, uh, are, they're used to people. So for example, this one here. And then there's other species that aren't so, uh, you know, people friendly, like the ruddy duck. You, they were keeping their distance away from me, basically kind of, I would walk to one end of the uh, pond and then they would walk back to the or swim back to the other and kind of we just went back and forth at the same distance each time. Then we had the hooded merganser. So it's just kind of give you a difference in size here. You're going to see the hooded and then you'll see the the uh, mallard duck as well come into the screen. So you can really see the difference between them and how as part of the reasons why the mallard is so uh, healthy in population is they are more aggressive and they are larger and are more adaptable as well too. Then we have the American coot, and you can got to love those feet. And uh, so again, you can see them sporadically throughout Southern Ontario. And uh, here's an example of them here where you can, they're just kind of uh, swimming along. They swim better than they walk. It is quite the uh, awkward, funny experience to watch them. And you can see the, again, the difference in size of the American black duck compared to the American coot. And here's a great example of it basically walking uh, on rocks and you'll see it almost fall over right there. So uh, horn larks, they are one of the first species that come back during the winter. So it's kind of nice to see them. I consider them the first signs of spring, even though it can be late January, early February when I see them come back. So sometimes we'll get a January thaw and that's often when I find they start to come back. And then there's the Baba link. So Dundalk, Markdale, uh, throughout those areas up towards Leith and Meaford area. That is where I would expect to see them. And then you can see the female there as well, too. They kind of look like they're wearing a toque. So I always enjoy seeing them at early May is the best time to see them. And then, like I said, we have the gray catbird here. And uh, the male has a darker, heavier patch on their head. 
And then you can see a youngster here. Eastern meadowlarks, uh, great areas to find them is in April and May in ball diamonds. Uh, I've seen them at Markdale ball diamond and uh, towards, uh, uh, where else have I seen? Meaford area as well too. Now house finches, uh, you can get them to actually come to your yard as well too, or actually in this case, this is the purple finch, but the purple finch will come if you've got Niger seed feeders. So keep the Niger seed uh, handy even into April, May, and even the first few weeks of June, because if they're nesting in your area, they will utilize it as a feeding, uh, feeding stop as well. Not as common as, they won't come as often, but they still will utilize it in uh, some occasions. Then there's the dark-eyed junco, which I'm sure just if you walk through anywhere, uh, with a, a bit of kind of vines and that, that you can get the, you'll get to see them. Snow bunting, seen them in Mark area, Leith, the Beaver Valley. So again, just driving down the road is a good chance to have a, uh, a view of them. And they often can be in flocks of five, six, 10. And I've seen them in Markdale area up to a thousand. So that is a tremendous flight. And it tends to be early early winter when you'll get to see that type of thing. So November into December is when the flocks are generally larger. Then we have the American tree sparrow. The American tree sparrow is one of the first sparrows I was introduced to in Markdale at my feeders. So sunflower seeds was often where uh, what would draw them in. Same with the chipping sparrow. It was another one that I had come to my feeding station. So they are throughout all Southern Ontario. So there's a good chance you'll get to see them where you are as well too. And just setting up your feeders could draw them, draw them to your yard. Then there's field sparrows. They are kind of in the Wyerton area as well as I'm sure throughout other parts of Gray County as well, but uh, not as uh, common as say the Savannah sparrow here, which is one that uh, basically driving around the town of Markdale, I'd see them on fence posts. And especially in uh, May and early June, uh, in the morning and uh, burning in the morning in general is your best time because of the fact that it will uh, the birds are hungry after a night of, of resting and so they're more active then. Then we have the swamp sparrow. The swamp sparrow is one that you can see uh, in your in the Thornberry area as well as the white throated sparrow especially during the late last two weeks of April and the first few weeks of May. Keep an eye out for them because they are uh, more active then, and they will visit your feeders, but even hiking in the woods, you stand a great chance of seeing them up. It's, for example, the uh, uh, any trails in the area, just keep an eye out, uh, out for them. White Crown Sparrow, this is actually from Markdale. So again, this is, would be late April, early, uh, early May. And uh, again, they'll come to your feeders and they often will feed on the ground. They're one of the few birds I don't often see sitting actually on the feeders as well. And then in the fall or late summer, you'll get to see some of the youngsters. There's a youngster of a song sparrow there. And it is one that, um, you know, you can see kind of how the feathers are a little bit more uh, straggly then, but it is a good time to see the young. And the young tend to let you get a little bit closer too. I found that to be the case. So it's a good chance to see them up close. Then we have the Eastern Towhee. And some people call it the Eastern Towie, but uh, Towie works. And uh, so here's an, one of the ways to draw them. They are in, in the uh, Gray County area. And you can thrush leaves with your feet because they're actually a really curious bird, especially if that's where they plan on nesting because they actually look for food that way as well too. So they believe that it could be a rival male that is there or maybe a female uh, that's you know heard his song so they will come out and give you a real good view of themselves when you thrush some leaves and then just sit there still and you can watch them or even take photographs of them as well as they prop themselves up on on the limbs there now we're going to take a look at owls again because this is a way the best way to experience an owl like the great horned owl here is to basically find their nest. And a little trickier in your area or Thornberry area compared to where I live because in Niagara here, the woodlands are fragmented. So I can literally see the through the woods and then uh, see if there's a nest there that's in the shape of a, uh, you know, is it a hawk in there or is it an owl in there? 
but I'll give you some hints and hopefully it helps you experience them too. I locate most of my ear, owls by ear or large nest. And when you have that large nest, what I don't even look for anything specific when it comes to birds, what I look for is shape. So if it's a round, if it's a larger bird, say a bird of prey, and it, they have a rounder head, but no triangles on top, then I go, okay, that's most likely a uh, hawk of some sort. But if I see a, you know, a large bird of prey in there that has tufts and kind of triangle shapes on both sides of the head, then I can pretty much go, oh, that is an owl. So by going out in the evening uh, and listening, and this is generally January, February, and March, you can pretty much locate them by the, their call. The male and the female will be communicating back and forth. And so, for example, where I live, they can start their calls as early as late December. Uh, and then, but most of the time, most years, if we're going by an average winter, I would say it would be mid uh, February would be when they start to really get into their area. So in the thorn barrier, I would suspect that it would be more so early March because there is a difference in the weather between uh, those two locations, the Niagara region as well as Thornberry. And uh, I remember living in Markdale and hearing their calls, but I could never find their nest. So it is a little bit trickier because of the fact that there is more uh, wooded areas up there compared to where I live, but not 100% um, you know, unlikely that you will find them. If you can zero in on the sound, you stand a much better chance of potentially finding them. Also, when they leave the nest is an excellent time to view them because of the fact that they don't want to move because they're not confident in their flying yet. And therefore they'll stay still. And the only thing I've had to watch for when I do this is to make sure that I'm not I don't have the, one of the adults swoop at them. So what I do to get to know my owls is I actually go in there one to two weeks beforehand and keep visiting without my camera gear because and staying a good distance away and not being aggressive at all. And that has given me some good luck. But at the same time, I've had others that have been actually swooped at by owls as well as hawks and that too. So it's it's all on temperament. I suppose in that case, and I actually do talk to them. So if you ever see a guy that's talking <laughs> to what looks like trees, it might be me because of the fact that I tend to um, talk to them because I figure a predator does not generally talk to their prey. So that's the way I looked at it. And so far it's made things a lot, a lot easier that way in getting close to them. And so generally what I found is, for example, in the Huntsville area, I was told that they tend to leave the nest in May. So that would be more apt to be the case in Thornberry, whereas down here, I've had them leave as early as the end of March, so in the Niagara region. So, uh, but if you do track them and find the nest, it, you'll have one youngster that still won't leave. And, that to, and so it's usually the weather that kind of drives them out and the desire to be out of the nest as well, too. If you get to know them really well, too, you'll learn habits. So this one, this is the female, for example, she fell asleep and actually allowed me to get close because their hearing is so sharp. They actually do most of their hunting by their hearing. And then you can see her zero in right in on me here and uh, spot me very, very quickly once she got her bearings together. And the male is usually never more than 100 meters away uh, from the nest. That's what I found each time I went to this particular nest is he was always around, generally in a pine tree. So do check pine trees for uh, any owl, really. But uh, great horned owls are, are ones that you could see potentially in them because they do like to sit there. They helps them stay dry, helps them stay hidden. And so that's what you're seeing here, the male on his pine tree. He had a couple pine trees that he seemed to like to go to. So I, and he could still see the nest, but he could also see me as well too, but also up high. So he was a good distance away from me. Eventually that other little one did leave the nest here. And you can see all that down on the front. They're just so fluffy. I've had people say that they just want to rub their belly or their chest and that because it's so, it looks so soft. And Again, at that time of year, you can have some very sharp cold fronts come through. And of course that uh, can change the conditions uh, quite drastically. 
And so you're just looking at sandhill cranes, which you can see in the Markdale area across to uh, Meaford, Leith area. And then there's the Great Egret. Uh, the Great Egret is one that I've seen in the Beaver Valley area, especially in some of the swampy areas. So it's something to keep an eye out for. Goldfinches, again, you can see them pretty much anywhere. They do feed in August on thistles quite a bit. So August into early uh, early September is a good time to see them around Scottish thistles. So you can see them. And then, like I said, the blue gray gnat catcher. Uh, I generally don't see them in the fall migration to, uh, that often, but the spring migration, you have a great chance to. The great blue heron, I've seen them in the beaver along the Beaver River. Uh, I've actually seen them in Thornberry along the river there as well too. Uh, Owen Sound, Harrison Park. So you do have a lot of options with them. They really remind me of the pterodactyl when it comes to uh, birds. And also sandpiper. So there's the spotted sandpiper, but uh, one that I've seen quite a bit in uh, the Markdale area as well as towards Walters Falls, for example, is one called the Upland Sandpiper. And I've seen them in ditches, and that because they actually nest in fields and other uh, other areas of just along the roadsides. But an area that's worth walking, if you're uh, along a beach, anywhere from Collingwood right on up to Owen Sound, is just keep an eye in both the spring, but more so in the kind of late summer to early fall time of year for these potential uh, pipers. Uh, you can get many different species along the uh, shoreline. And one of the techniques that I use for getting close to them is I let, they generally go up and down the beach searching for food. Each of one of those waves tends to expose the food that they're looking for. And you'll kind of see them track out, out after the wave there and that uh, because they're finding more food. But uh, I just stand in one spot. This is actually from my phone. So you can see just how close they were getting there. And that, uh, that is something that you can experience as well too, because it is really neat when it uh, does happen. And then of course, when a larger wave does come in, it'll drive them back. And sometimes it'll drive them towards your direction as well too. So this is in November and it's a mixed flock of sandpipers and that too. So probably October would be the latest I would expect to see them in Georgian Bay because that was Lake Erie there as well. Now, Warblers. Now, these are the birds that everyone loves to see, and you can see them pretty much throughout the area, uh, you know, Gray and uh, Gray and Bruce and Simcoe. And there's the Nashville Warbler. And generally, again, it's the last week of April, but more so for your area, I would say your area would be the first two weeks of, of May, even the first three weeks of May. So we had the yellow warbler. That was the first warbler that I ever saw, and that was in the Markdale area. Then there was the chestnut-sided warbler. Both of those warblers I just mentioned are ones that you can see in, in the Thornberry area, with the valley, all through there. So it's definitely something to keep an eye out for. Then there's the Magnolia warbler, generally one that you're gonna see kind of pass back through in migration in those first few weeks of May. Same with the Cape May. So these are species that people really look for because of just how beautiful and colorful they are. And there's the black-throated blue warbler. There's not too many, bird species in nature that are blue, but you can see that uh, the black-throated blue is spectacular that way. Then we have the yellow rumped warbler, as you can clearly see why they have that name. So that would be one I would expect to see there. This black-throated green warbler, I've seen them at uh, Eugenia Falls, as well as up in the Wyerton area. The black Bernian warbler is another spectacular one. And the pine warbler, <laughs> the first time I ever saw one of these, I actually thought it was a goldfinch, but then later realized it was actually the pine warbler and that was in Markdale as well too. The palm warbler, when they're on the ground, you'll see them pump their tail. So it's really neat, they tend to feed on the ground. Then there's the black pole warbler, as well as the black and white warbler. And I tend to see them more in the middle sections of the trees as well too. American red start kind of reminds me a bit of a red winged blackbird, but smaller as well as the oven bird. So the oven bird, I'm not sure how it got its name, but it is one that you'll see generally on the ground in the wooded area. There's the common yellow throat. So keep an area eye out for cattails and things like that. And keep really in the month of the month of May is your best time. 
And then the hooded warbler is one that is actually in the Collingwood area as well too. So definitely keep an eye out for them because it is a rare one. And if you ever see one, I know you'll light up when you see it. Beautiful contrast. Blue jays, of course, they feed on peanuts and uh, they are bossy at the feeders. So uh, I'm sure that's probably one of the first birds that you ever experience or will ever experience. And then there's the common red pole. Common red poles, they will feed on Niger seeds. And I had them in Markdale when I had feeder setups and Owen Sound, I've heard reports of over a hundred at the feeders during the winter. So definitely set up your Niger seed for that aspect. Then there's the American Robin. I think that's probably the, the best chance of experiencing a nest in your yard is the American Robin. And about 8% of them make up for all albino creatures. So there's and a great example of some of the white uh, lack of pigment in their feathers. And then the cowbird, cowbirds, uh, I have, I've seen them pretty much in Markdale, uh, Meaford, uh, Olin Sound. So they're quite common throughout the area as well too. Chickadees, probably another one that you see quite a bit of, and you can get them to feed out of your hand by put, holding out uh, sunflower seed. And uh, so it, it may take a bit of time with ones that you're handling or have come into your feeder, but over time they will get, you'll gain their trust as well too. And you can see a partial albino there. And you also saw a boreal there earlier, which can be seen at Algonquin Park too. White wing crossbill, uh, that's the male, there's the female, they're eruptive. So sometimes they are in your area during the winter and sometimes they're not. Then we have the cedar waxwing. I've seen them at Harrison Park. I've seen them in Meaford. Uh, this is actually uh, Craigleith area there, a nice couple. And it's really neat when you get to see them, uh, their breeding habits and how the male feeds the female. And that was in Meaford there as well too. So very local. The Northern Oriole continues to spread its range across Southern Ontario. I, I've seen them many times along the Beaver, uh, Beaver River as well as in Markdale at my feeders. They love orange halves and uh, that's what I mainly use because it's natural and it's good for them. And you can spot them easier by these nests as well, these nests here, um, uh, kind of the weaved nests there. And we talked earlier about the goldfinch. So niger seeds are the best way to get them to your yard. And they tend to breed a little later into the season as well because of the fact they heavily rely on the Scottish thistle. Uh, the gray jay. So I like to talk a little bit about other species as well too. Gray jay doesn't come into the Thornberry area. But again, if you go up to Alconquin Park, you stand a good chance of seeing them, especially along Spruce Bog Boardwalk and the visitor center there too. And bird baths are a great way to draw, not just the traditional songbirds to your yard, but maybe even other birds because all birds need water as well too. And of course the Cardinals, uh, one of the reasons I got into photography and I would often see them in the Markdale area around cedar trees, as well as get them to come to some feeders with the, uh, the sunflower seeds. They love sunflower seeds. So if you have cedar trees in your yard, and you have uh, set up sunflower seeds, there's a good chance that you may get to actually enjoy them in your own backyard without having to go out into the country and looking and uh, looking for them in that too. And a great example of the male in, in his spring plumage as well as the female prime colors at that point. And then the red-winged blackbird, roadsides, you can see them there as well as uh, marshes with cattails and so on. There's the female and uh, the common grackle, although not a popular bird per se, the sunlight hits them just right, they can have that beautiful metallic color uh, with them as well too. So it's not completely uh, a bird that you go and say, oh, that's just a black bird. There's actually some beautiful colors with it as well too. There's a female ruby throated hummingbird. They love their nectar uh, feeders in your backyard as well. And then I cover this one again too, because the downy woodpecker is generally the, going to be the first woodpecker that you have come to you. And again, you can even get them to feed out of your hands as well too by mixing sunflowers, but they prefer peanuts in, the, in your hand as well. Morning doves, they can have up to five broods a season in one season. So that's why there's so many of them. And then the house finch. So you saw the purple finch earlier. The house finch has a more reddish tone to them and uh, so you can see the male there with the striking color so niger seed is again a great way to get them to come 
to you. I've seen mockingbirds in the Markdale area, but I haven't seen them outside of there before. But then again, I lived in Markdale, so that was my predominant area of, of photography. And, uh, and then the uh, white-breasted nuthatch. So if you see birds climbing up and down the side of trees, that's generally what they are. And they also have the red-breasted as well too. And they kind of go underneath limbs and up the side down, up and up and down the side of trees as well too. And and that and they have their bills as well as their tongue can slip into the the bark. And that's where a lot of the the uh, bugs bugs are. So that is the presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed taking you through my experiences as well as some of the knowledge that I have of the Thornberry area. And uh, I really hope this helps you out and also shows you maybe you don't have to travel as far as you would think for that type of thing. And I always go out, when I go out, I have a kind of a number of birds that I'm looking for. So when it comes to that aspect, it allows me to go, okay, yes, I really want to see this bird today, but if I see three or four other species and maybe not the one I was going for, it still is a real treat because every, every bird is a, is a gem in that too. So uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this program and it brought me back home again, took me back through memories of my childhood, and I really hope it gives you future memories as well too. Big thank you to the Thornberry Public Library for having me with this program. It's uh, I've been working with them for years and it has been fantastic, an amazing relationship that we've had over those years. And uh, yes, just grateful to be able to share this with all of you. Have a fantastic day.